Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Matthew. Episode 239, recorded for the week of December 6th, 2023. The Cloud Pod sees the irony of using AI to assist with climate change. Hey, guys. Hello. Hola. Ooh, we're switching languages. Hola. Justin is on a boat Print. this week. Hello, world. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Justin. We're thinking of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we miss you. The kids are running the insane asylum today. Mm. Think he misses us? I don't think he does. No. Yeah. He's in a much happier place. <laughs> Nutella all over our fingers and Lego all over the floor. And, uh, <laughs> the, the show is going to be what it's going to be today. <laughs> Okay, well, first up with general news, Broadcom has announced the successful acquisition of VMware, finally. Uh, they completed the acquisition. It's, it's been going on for a while. Um, they're most, I think they're most known for their networking communication chips, things like uh, Wi-Fi chipsets, mobile chipsets, things like that. But they also have a large portfolio, including Rally software, CA, uh, Plex, uh, not the video streaming service, uh, Clarity, Symantec, they bought uh, a while ago, and SiteMinder. And um, I think people at VMware aren't too happy. I think VMware was a very work-from-home friendly company. And the, the news recently, the, the noise on Twitter and various other places has been uh, quite negative. Um, Broadcom CEO wants to see people's butts in seats or, uh, or find new jobs. So it's going to be quite a shake-up over there. Yeah, and I mean, they did announce a very large, like I want to say 5, 5% layoff of VMware staff based on that, on the acquisition as well. So it's, you know, there's a lot of changes and it is a lot of shakeup. We'll see what comes of it. I feel like whenever you get acquired, a lot of the duplicated admin services and like HR, finance, some of those kind of Mm -hmm. naturally, yeah. like whenever a company gets acquired, I feel like there's always layoffs within the first like six months. And it's really just a lot of those overlapping services now that the parent org has them. But I didn't know that they owned Symantec. That was news to me. Yeah. I just hope, you know, that they do exciting things. Um, you know, Tanzu being a little bit of a disappointment this time in terms of an offering on top of Kubernetes. And, and uh, hopefully this is the, the you know, the, the parent hive mind breathes life into that. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, especially with Tanzu, there was always that promise. And I've sat in with some old customers on like VM were pitching them of like, sure, set it up here, get it all to run in containers and then, you know, lift and shift and you already have your everything in containers. So you can kind of just expand onto the cloud and really use it more as burstability, which was really like something that they were pitching with the benefits of Tanzu. So if they could actually make something like that work and be effective, it'd be a, you know, a pretty nice service. Run your core stuff here. And when you need your, Black Friday special, your healthcare first of the year, or open enrollment, you know, whatever your absurd peak is of the year, just burst into the cloud. It's it's an interesting use case that definitely is out there that would be interesting to see if you know VMware can actually capitalize on it. It's interesting we've seen partnerships with VMware running um, virtualization somewhat natively on Google and uh, Azure over the past few years. But I think it, uh, to me, uh, VM, VMware seems kind of a, a bit of a dead end product in a way, like with, with the mass migration to cloud and that being the way that the world seems to be moving. Um, I wonder if they, they were only open to acquisition because they've kind of lost a bit of mind share there and, and people don't want to run their own private data centers. I think they're definitely losing the small and medium businesses, but the large customers with on-prem installs, definitely there's still you know companies that want that you know, to be able to virtualize their environments because what are your other options? Hyper-V? I think I don't really know. OpenShift? Kind of what are, the, what are your other real options here if you're going to run a data center? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that the big value prop was for a lot of these things was, you know, being able to run that virtualized infrastructure and then the partnerships are, you know, to be able to run that with the same skill sets and the same people running both without having to get into the specifics of, you know, AWS or Azure cloud specifics. Um, and so offering that as sort of a generalized compute, I think as cloud has become more sort of prevalent and popular and there's more people that know it, not enough, but still more. Um, 
I think that value really goes down where you no longer need that sort of UI driven cloud management service that VMware provided for, for years. I was really just hoping like with Tanzu that they were going to sort of bring order to the Kubernetes chaos in terms of, you know, namespaces and, and, and security and access policies around that. But I think they sort of suffered from the, just the, the overall sort of adoption of, of Kubernetes and containers in general. That's been a little bit of wild, wild west. So it's Tanzu adoption apparently is really hard. Um, and doesn't really solve a lot of those problems. It just enforces a new construct on the existing problems. Turns out containerization is hard. Who would have guessed? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's, it's not like a natural step. It's not like a natural progression from what we have already to to, to Tanzu or to anything else. So to, to launch a product like that is, is quite ballsy, and I, I don't think it's worked out very well for them, really. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so the, uh, the usual AI is going great section. We've moved to the end. So the after show, we're going to talk about OpenAI a little bit. Um, and we're not going to talk about AWS this week as we did the massive recap of uh, reInvent for the last episode. So we'll move on to GCP. All right. Starting us off, early registration is now open for Google Cloud Next, April 9th through 11th in Las Vegas. You may Fever. be thinking... Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> you may be thinking that Google Next just happened. And you would be right. But as part of the move to Las Vegas, they've moved the dates for the next one up until April. Early bird pricing is currently available for $999 or 50% off the full price. Plus, you can get access to the room blocks at the Mandalay Bay in advance. So you got nothing better to do in April. You want to go learn about some Google Cloud services. This is your ticket. When was it this past year? I thought it was like May, So, but maybe I'm wrong. No, it was. I think it was June. Oh, so they're moving up two months. Yeah, I feel bad for all the uh, internal Google employees that now have two months less to get the features and new products out the door. Hmm. Are you guys going? Um, being a current GCP cloud, you know, provider for for my business and the day job, yeah, I'll probably end up going. I, you know, like most conferences. I find are it's a great opportunity to talk to product people and 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 peers about you know how you're managing cloud and how you're sort of offering the service to the rest of your business and and it's a great way to sort of exchange that feedback. Um, you know, I, I think you know lately I've been attending more and more conferences virtually, which is you know plus it's got its pros and minuses. Um, pluses and minuses, pros and cons. Pros and cons. I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, the keynotes and stuff, you, you get a lot of that and you can do that virtually, but there's nothing that makes up for those in-person conversations when you're discussing strategy and roadmap. It's funny since Startnext has been hosted in San Francisco, which is only like 55 miles from me, uh, I'm much less likely to go because, you know, I don't get to expense a hotel. I have to drive there every morning at five o'clock in the morning to get there for the keynotes and things. I'm way more likely to go when it's in a different state. <laughs> yeah, I made that mistake the first couple of years because I'm, I'm even closer than you are. And uh, trying to to commute in for the conference was too exhausting. And when you start add in, adding in like meeting with vendors and dinners and other stuff like that, it just wasn't practical. So I actually did get a hotel and expense that this time because I was like, no way can I commute in starting at like 5 a.m. to get there for, for these meetings. Yeah, I mean, it's it's too much. You know, you wake up, you're there. Even at reInvent, the last couple of years that I went, it was, you know, weirdly, I would watch the keynote to my hotel room mm-hmm. and then leave the room at 11, go do whatever lunch I had, then, you know, go to whatever meetings I had throughout the afternoon come back, drop off my stuff, do dinner with vendors, whoever else I need to do, and then get back to my room at some ungodly hour that I was never happy at seeing. Um, but it's Vegas, so you can't actually ever tell what that time it is because you know, they just add more oxygen or whatever the hell they do to keep you awake yeah. there. I think there's just like cocaine in the air or something ridiculous. Um, you know, And then r- rinse, wash, repeat, and then you come back home after these conferences and you just... I think that is the most I've ever slept. And my wife at one point said to me, you know, I love the weekends after reInvent because you actually sleep. 
<laughs> so, yeah, it's funny. I looking back on the conferences I've been to, I think the value has never really been in in the um, the announcements, which you can get from anywhere. The I mean, sometimes the sessions are are good, but they're mostly available online, um, and they don't teach you anything that you can't learn from you know, blogs or people who are in the industry or anything else. I think that the, the absolute value of things like Next or Reinvent is is the community that, that goes there and gathers, and it's all the all the extra stuff to the to the actual event that, that makes it worth attending. Mm-hmm, yeah. So it's it's almost worth going to Vegas, not buying the ticket. Right. Um, and, and, and just socializing and meeting mm-hmm. people. Um, cause it, it can be quite isolating working in our individual industries, um, and our own challenges and things. It's, it's good to have other people to talk to. And I think, um, talking to other customers of, of, uh, of the cloud providers is, is super valuable mm-hmm. sharing experiences. Yeah. Like you said, the best, the best part of the conferences isn't, I think the last time I went to a conference to a class actually was with Ryan Lucas here. And it was when Image Builder for AWS was announced. Yeah. And it was because <laughs> we, we just, were working on a product. <laughs> we just got sure locked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were working on an internal product for him for like six months, just finished, just GA did internally. And they released it. And we we're like, let's go hear about it. And like, besides that, we didn't really touch it that much. So, like, I don't go to the classes because if I want something, it's recorded online. I can watch it in 2X later on and be fine. But it's really just the people and talking and the amount of interesting conversations I've had with random people that, you know, I keep in touch with even to today of like, there's a guy in the UK I talked to that I met at reInvent sitting in the certification lounge. Just started chatting and we started talking about architecture and stuff like that. And, you know, we kept in touch. So it's really the community of being there. Classes, sure. If you do the game days, those are always fun to do. If you do... I did the hackathons a couple times with these two. I think Ryan did it one year. Nope. Um, oh, Ryan never did it. So I've never done Jonathan it. and I did it. Actually, Thorne was Jonathan. Did we do it when Thorne was on? I didn't do it when Thorne was on. I did it with. Um, I did. We, we won a different time with the. Uh, okay. The, yeah. the Twitch streaming uh, charity. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but like those are fun. But like, again, you can do those wherever, but it's, you know, always nice to go sit with people that you are in the same industry, especially since we're all remote or, you know, and kind of just talk to people. All right. On to Google Cloud Storage Auto Class now available for existing cloud storage buckets. Last year, Google announced auto class functions for new buckets. Uh, Now there's two additional types that are in the default uh, between which allows you to move data between standard and near near line and opt-in, which moves between standard, near line, cold, and archive classes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, this is anything where the the service is enabling you to, you know, save a little money by moving your, you know, least access data to a, a cheaper storage tier with different performance characteristics I really like. And I like how automatic and, and sort of um, ubiquitous these features are coming, you know, cause we've, this has been functionality that the cloud providers themselves have been using to optimize costs and, and do things for forever. And so now it's, you know, established and they're passing that on to the customers and it, it provides more functionality. So I really like it. That's cool. So what's near line? Is that like AWS and frequent access? I think it's a reference to line speed. I think it's I think it's the other way where it's it's closer to um, what AWS just announced, which is um, the ones. Oh, on, like single Z. Uh, okay. I don't use it personally, so I I'm, could be talking out of school. But um, <laughs> come on, Google people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a reference to the fact that the storage is as, as fast. It, it can get you the data as fast as the network can can get it to you. In a way, it's kind of yeah. Like I, I think about the parity with like something like CloudFront or or um, or a CDN kind of thing. Like you know, you've got S3 on the back end, which is is slow, but in in one place, and then you've got consumers in different locations who are you know reaching out to local edge caches, and it, I, it's kind of the same the same principle in a way. It's just that uh, where do you persist the data most optimally for for speed and and performance? So yeah, it's neat. 
Yeah, I, I mean it's 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 kind of neat, and so it's I, I'd like that the the classes exist within an, uh, a storage bucket, and you don't have to move things between buckets to to change their classes, and for and therefore you don't have to add complexity to your lookups and your logic and your application code, and these are kind of cool. And so, and it a near line I did just do some real time research is exactly that, which is it's a, a little lower uh, resiliency for higher lines. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever forgive. AWS for their for the, for the way Glacier works, honestly. Where it's, well, you've got to put it in a bucket, but then you've got to move it to Glacier, and then it's not really in the bucket, but it looks like it's in the bucket, but then you've got mm-hmm. to move it back to the bucket, and it costs you money, and then it's really in the bucket, and then it can get back to it again. Like, that's, mm-hmm. I, I wish they just made that invisible. I'll never forget when a client decided to save some money, and they set their objects to drop to Glacier after 30 days, which, you know, it was a deployment bucket. It turned out this one app hadn't deployed. They hadn't done a new build in 30 days because nobody was working on it. And their system went to auto scale and crashed the auto scaling group because it couldn't retrieve the object because uh-huh. it had devolved down or whatever, mm-hmm. moved in storage tiers down to Glacier. And then I've told people to be very careful about Glacier yep. and lifecycle policies. And <laughs> if you turn, if you're Sucking a large amount of data back to recover from that, it's very expensive. Very expensive. So it's yeah, no, it's a it's a hard lesson to learn if you learn that the hard way. Yeah. All right. Well, Looker Studio has been refreshed. It's brought some powerful new um, tools, explorations, fresher data, and faster filtering. It has several enhancements, including personal report links, automated report updates, uh, with also refresh, faster filtering and reports, uh, pausing updates, and the ability to view underlying data. So our executive staff member isn't here to, you know, really tout the the uh, the benefits of having pretty pictures to look at and presentations and, and reports. So, uh, so you're gonna step in for that role? Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> hey, I, I drew a stick figure the other day. I'm good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On a napkin. Um, I, you know, these are good features. I, I specifically like the view underlying data. Um, Mostly just because I'm a giant dork and, and when I'm looking at some of these like, you know, BI reports on a BI software, like trying to understand like what they're showing me and how they're, you know, sort of crunching it together to, to make the pretty picture is, is kind of nice. And so I do like, I like the ability that they're adding that ability to sort of view into the data sets because usually that is obscured away where you can't access it. So it's kind of nice. And personal report links will be good too, just because you can deep link to meaningful content to, for people and not just point them to this like mess of data and and terrible pie charts. Yeah, I, I always wondered, I was always impressed actually by by how something like Google Docs uh, or Google Sheets could could work at massive scale because you, you can share the link with thousands or even millions of, of people um, who can all view the document. And and the, the best practice really is to, to give a certain group of, of people editor rights but you give a, the other set of people rights to make a copy, make a read-only copy, or to make a copy that they can edit personally. And so these personal report links lets you take a, take a personal copy of, of the report configuration and then modify it in your own sandbox so that you, you can play around with it without actually updating the original curated oh, data wow. set and, and, and uh, report that was provided. So you can play around with it without, um, without ruining it for anybody else. That's impressive. I didn't re- I didn't catch that when I read through it. So that's that is really nice because it's it's more than just a read only copy of the data. Yeah. If you can actually own, you know, add your own filters and add your own perspective on the data, that's, and then show it back. That's cool. Yep. All right. Introducing BigQuery cross region replication enhanced geo redundancy for your data. Google is announcing in preview cross region data set replication. Woohoo! Uh, this allows you to easily replicate any data set, including ongoing changes across cloud regions. In addition to the ongoing replication use cases, you can use cross-region replication to migrate your BigQuery data sets from one source region to another destination region. Sweet. I just wonder what client said, oh, we accidentally launched in this region and we need to move, and now we have to build a tool to help us move it without mm-hmm. losing anything. Like, What was the... What was the use case? You've never had to move uh, S3 buckets or, or something <laughs> just to be closer to a customer data set? Uh, no, I mean, this is a... Um, I understand the full feature of the real-time yeah. replication, but like, what was the conversation that started this? Was it 
the real time replication or was it the, hey, we need to migrate the data? Mm-hmm. Like what time without writing a script? <laughs> Well, looking at the, you know, the, the innards on how they're sort of making the replica set using, you know, SQL statements in there. I, I do think that the, the cross region replication was the first class citizen there. I hope so. Um, cause it, they, you can do some cool things. You can, um, I don't, I don't know of any use cases where big query performance is really a, a concern cause that's not really the use case, but maybe, maybe it is a concern for certain application workloads. And so this effectively gives you the ability to, to treat your secondary region as a read replica um, to distribute load um, as it's ongoing. So that's, you know, that's a pretty cool tool as well. Um, you know, and I just like the the resiliency of having that data available in multiple regions. I know most of the larger or more impactful DNR, DR scenarios that I've had to experience, it's usually with these large data lake data sets because they're super expensive to replicate and it's oftentimes not worth it, but then you lose all that functionality um, if you rely on reporting on that data in your data lake. The nice thing about it is is the way it sort of works under the covers in that you don't have to address the replica using a different name. Like mm-hmm. if, if you're in that region mm-hmm. and you want to make a make a read, it will read from the replica. Yep. Uh, so you, you know if the if the primary region goes down, you don't need to update anything. Mm-hmm. The, cruise, the cruise will still work. Yeah, yeah. Like magic on the background, and if you want to promote yeah. the, the the secondary region to become a primary and be a, be the writable region, you can do so. And it's it's all just uh, very seamless. It's very mm-hmm. nicely done. It's a very nice feature because there was a lot of times on AWS it was like put the region name in so it knows where stuff is, whether it's in the SQL or mm-hmm. whatnot. Mm-hmm. And AWS added a feature. I think it was on Aurora Postgres first. Where when you wrote, it might have been MySQL, you you could just write to any of read replicas and it would forward to the writer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the bit the bit the proxy for, for that the uh, the RDS yeah. proxy. Yeah, no, no, it's not RDS proxy. It's a feature of Aurora in itself. So you could write, tell it to write to a read only, and it would just send the write to where it needed to go. So it was great for like a cross region replica. You would send the write like if you mainly had a write uh, read app, but like you had a few write requests. You would send it to the same DNS and it would just route to the right location. It's kind of what this reminds me mm-hmm. of. With like, it's just the name. They handle all the magic behind the scenes, all the stuff you just don't care about. Take care of it for me. I don't want to deal with like, hey, I got to flip this, redeploy, change the variable name of my container, whatever it is. It just works. Same thing. You're done. Yeah, especially for people with like Java apps and things where you're not constantly monitoring your uh, configuration system for changes and updates so like well, now you need to point to this location for a query you don't have to do it you don't have to change anything all managed for mm-hmm. you on the back end beautiful what are you talking about tom and java <laughs> boot up so quickly it doesn't matter you just do a no hop of the service and it just restarts it will magically be up jonathan what, what could go wrong mm-hmm. never had any problems with those things <laughs> Well, speaking of problems and climate change and AI. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> Nicely done. I really thought it was. Yeah. It took me a second to get there, but I really thought it was there. <laughs> uh, Google and the Boston Consulting Group has released a report which shows AI has the potential to mitigate 5 to 10% of the global greenhouse gas emission by 2023. Sorry, 2030. Don't know where I got that number, original number. Um, they said that this will be happening by burning... Billions of watts of power with GPUs. Just kidding. <laughs> um, the report lists three ways that AI can transform effects of climate of the climate progress. Providing helpful data like fuel efficiency and routing, predicting climate relevant events, particularly around flooding, and optimizing climate actions. They gave an example about analyzing contrail data including satellite imagery, weather, and flight path data. AI could use the data to develop contrail forecast maps and suggest for pilots to avoid routes that create contrails. They test flights, and they found that pilot reduction in contrails by 54%. What a bunch of fluff. (laughs) Honestly. Yeah. Let's... Yeah, like Europe's talking about having to build power stations to power data centers because of the demand from cloud providers, 
uh, especially with AI adoption. And, and so to, to say that it's accelerating climate change action is kind of a stretch. I mean, sure, I guess there are some use cases where AI, AI could help us out with, with finding things that perhaps we couldn't do otherwise, but none of these things are rocket science. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a, what, what a marketing piece. It was a, <laughs> it, yeah, it's a stretch to read and you're just like, wait, it, I was trying to keep an open mind for about two and a half sentences. And then it was just like, what are you talking about? Cause it's, it is a lot of, you know, like look at the power of AI, you know, which is another one of those articles, which, you know, I'm quite tired of at this point. And it, 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 it doesn't, the article itself has no understanding of the irony of that the AI impact on environments and, and these things is a huge contributor. And, and then the contrail example I thought was just like, you know, just to piece the resistance. Cause it's like, you, you can go either way on that. You can put your tinfoil hat on and say, it's the government and the contrails and, <laughs> and, or, you know, like, you, um, and, or you can go into the, you know, the, the crazy AI portion of this. And it's just uh, like, what, what am I reading? Okay. So hold on. I agree. I'm going to start with that, but the same point, let's take a, let's, let me try to play devil's advocate here. Mm-hmm. So in particular use cases, it might be able to help. For example, the pilots shipping routes, optimizing cargo ships. It can probably help with those things. But the amount of other use cases where people are going to be using AI that aren't going to help the environment, I feel like is going to outweigh it. And the quantity of GPUs that, that require more power, more everything in order to handle these things. You know, we said a few weeks ago, Microsoft announced on Monday, I don't remember the date to making this up, Monday that they had the largest, you know, cluster ever created of GPUs. And on Tuesday, I think it was Google announced they had the largest cluster. You know, so it's like, Sure, we are saving and we can be more efficient in these seven ways, but do those seven ways actually outweigh the other 500 ways people are going to be using this technology? Yeah. I can't imagine that it offsets. Um, I do think that it's good to at least, you know, I don't think you can stop AI. I think the, the advancement that is AI is beneficial. Um, so you should offset what you can, but articles like this are sort of like, I don't know. Like I, what, you know, like it's, it's meant to be a look how responsible we are sort of tout and it's, 100%. and it's sort of like, but, but, but you're causing that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, the starting point was Google with the Boston consulting group mm-hmm. who paid the bill for this article. Yeah. 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 yeah I, mean, I, I think, I think any new technology will be inefficient to begin with and will be optimized over time. And I, I do see some great potential. There's already some great uses for AI. Um, you know, Deep Mind has done some amazing work, like AlphaFold, protein folding for drug discovery. Um, uh, just recently, there was an article around um, uh, Deep Mind identifying um, candidates for like different kind of materials, metamaterials for solar cells, anything from solar cells, and nanotechnology, or medical implants, or all kinds of things like that. So, so we can we can use AI to do some amazing things. But we, we can't pretend that it's at, at no um, no short term cost for sure. You know, it's done some great things with advancements and, like you said, you know the DNA stuff, and it also does really great like punching up my performance review at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does. Don't tell my secrets to my <laughs> HR department. A bit, I, I have like a, I'm going to keep in my head a little mental segue that I want to say until we, we talk about AI, AI at the end a little bit about, about bots <laughs> and AI. <laughs> anyway, um, Google's reminding us again that their data centers in Europe are going to help the EU meet its sustainability goals. Uh, they say that digitalization is going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not quite sure what digitalization actually means. Um, They're digital. The, Digitalizing the greenhouses. Uh, quite, quite possibly. I mean, the, the paperless office was like a promise of the, the 80s and the 90s, and I, I still see HP printers in, in every office I've ever worked in and tons of paperwork. You know, we just scan things in now and shred it instead, so it's just as wasteful as we ever were. So we'll, that's kind of – do you mean to be seen exactly what they mean by digitalization? I'm very proud of myself for saying that four times now without screwing yeah. it up. Good luck. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Bravo, the podcast is over. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I can leave now. Uh, Google do operate the most energy efficient data centers, uh, um, offsetting their energy consumption with renewable sources like solar and wind, as do AWS. Um, 
and they have started many local projects to support local communities, including things like um, reduction in water consumption um, or reusing heated water in projects to things like uh, uh, supplying um, hot water for heating in, in homes in some parts of the world. So, uh, yeah, good to you, Google. One of their one of their examples, though, was like attracting investment in the region, and and so they're. I thought that was a little self serving in the sense of like, wait, this is your how you're meeting sustainability goals is to encourage people to pay you money, like, mm. <laughs> like okay, like it's a. I don't know what if it was you know around re- reinvent or whatnot, but the this is another one of those like sort of feel good pieces, and I think Google is you know leading the way in in this this sector which i'm really in support of but it's also like when i read these articles they make me so skeptical (laughs) or or cynical i'd rather indeed next up because we don't get enough ai we can have 12 days of no cost training to learn generative ai this december so as as matt so eloquently put it when we're discussing shows their own advent calendar for the for the, the holiday season for generative AI. So each day you get the gift of no cost learning. There are 12 classes. There's generative AI explained, the introduction to generative AI, the introduction to large language models, generative AI fundamental skill badge, which I guess is a test. And that's the, yeah, anyway, it's, I guess it's better than being all birds like that. But uh, yeah, and so it's, you know, gener- there's a couple other ones for, for different use cases of generative AI. Um, some use the use of the, the studio tools for UX driven model training and, and use of AI. And so, eh, cool. What does Cody learn in 20 seconds? And I, I kind of see this like uh, the flyers get in the mail sometimes, like, can we get a free test drive? Like, mm-hmm. uh, they're, I appreciate the, the the want to spread information, and AWS has done the same thing with their promise to to help train a million new people in AI technologies. But ultimately, it's very self serving. They want to mm-hmm. you know, build new build new customer base. Yeah, and um, look, here's our tools, and look how good they are to use. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which so, is you know, marketing education in sheep's clothing, perhaps. Yeah. I'm still waiting for the first job description to say must have 10 plus years in Gen AI experience. (laughs) (laughs) Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS GCP Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiative stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution. Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud-native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentsnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPods sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul, and they bring their own juice. Off to Azure, or Azure, depending on how you say it, and it, it, more AI. It's only if you're that's fancy. That's really what we need in life. Yeah. I'm pinky finger out fancy right now, Ryan. <laughs> it's a Wednesday night, and I'm on PTO all week. I'm doing the CloudPod. Yeah. It's pinky finger out time. Um, and in case people wanted more AI, um, Azure during the Ignite conference announced their first custom CPU. Um, they is, I think, if I remember correctly, supposed to be able to use it shortly. Um, their first custom AI accelerated accelerator is called Azure Maya, designed to run cloud-based training and interference for AI workloads such as OpenAI being. GitHub, Copilot, 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 and ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, Maya's 100, 100 is the first generation of the series with 105 billion transistors, making it one of the largest chips on a five nanometer process technology. I have no idea if 105 billion transistors is a lot, but apparently it is. Sounds like that's, a lot. That's a large number. Like, if you think about something um, like the very first ARM chips had 30,000 transistors. 
Okay, but how many decades ago was that? That's 35 years. Okay. For, oh, really? Yeah, 30 years. About 30, about 30. Yeah, ARM's been yeah, around about, for a really long time. About 87, 88, I think somewhere around there was, 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 was when ARM first built their, built their first chip. Um, but yeah, 30,000 30, then- transistors. That's how. That's yeah, how. That's why it. they're so efficient because they're so damn small. Yeah, yeah. I read an article at one point that was like the whole history of them. But like, also remember, wasn't Mac running on ARM? Yep. Like, pow- wasn't the power whatever it was called before they moved to Intel ARM processors? It, it was their little Palm Pilot thing, wasn't it? What's was it called? Um, I forget the name of it now. No, no, no. They're pre them moving to Intel. They ran on Power PC chips, yeah. which I think were ARMs. That was Power PC. That. Yeah, no, that was IBM. That was that's different. So like ARM's been ARM's been around for a lot longer than people really think. Yeah. And like most a lot of like cars and whatnot that have chips in them were all ARMs. Anyway, back to my <laughs> they're announcing Azure Cobalt built on ARM architecture for optimizing performance performance and watt efficiency, powering common cloud workloads for Microsoft Cloud, which obviously are gonna be Microsoft Windows. Cobalt 100 in the first generation is 64 bit with 129 core chip, delivering up to a 40% performance improvement over current generation of Azure ARM chips and is powering services such as Teams and Azure SQL. <laughs> the fact that they need such such compute to run Teams is, yeah, yeah. is just, just amazing. I, I it, it, it tracks with my experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it just like that's why they just released the new, more efficient one. Come on, new teams. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't good enough just to re- give it a new version of them. They actually literally called it new teams. Yep. Yeah. I know. And then the old one now got renamed on my computer to call Teams Classic. Oh, teams. They really tried to get me to move off <laughs> yeah. of it, but like every time I use it, it just crashes. I just don't care enough. It's, it's the doubt though. Every, every time I load it off, it's like, are you sure you want to keep using the new one? Like, why? Is there something I don't know? <laughs> are you peer pressuring me? I don't deal well with peer pressure. <laughs> I just want to show me when people are online or not and where my meetings yeah. are and let me chat with people. That's that's all I ask. Uh, I, I, I don't know about this whole delivering up to X many percent performance improvement over a previous thing. Like you, you put more compute into a, into another package and call it twice as, twice as fast. Is that... Is that is that really meaningful? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think this metric is. As long as is, I'm paying the same amount, then yeah. exactly. <laughs> is, it, is it costing the same to the environment? Is it costing the same to me? Like that's that's what really matters, I think, ultimately. Yeah. But no, you're paying forty percent more for all of it. Yeah. But don't worry about those details. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess in terms of no, real I, estate, I think it is cheaper. In terms of real estate, if you can fit more compute into into the same number of square feet as less compute, then sure, you're not paying, uh, you know, massive real estate companies uh, rent. For, uh, for your data center, but I would think that would be one of the, the last optimizations they'd need to make, not, not one of the first. Yeah. Well, they're trying to expand and have more regions, like all the cloud providers. So if they can have more regions, less real estate, less maintenance. So, hey, we need to go launch a region in Zimbabwe, but we only need a small building to get us up and running versus 17 buildings. That's kind of where they'll... And so they have the capacity for whatever they need. That's kind of where my brain's at. Okay. Of That's like, fair. we can become more dense and stuff like that because every cloud provider right now is like, hey, we now have a region here and here and here and here and everyone gets a region. So, you know. Yeah, That's yeah I don't That's think fair. real estate though is the is the constraint anymore though. Like, and so I think that it's no, power. It's the power yeah. And so like, and these things aren't, I mean, ARM is, is an exception because ARM chips are more efficient, but. Typically, I think the the custom silicon of the the cloud providers. I haven't seen that touted, and I, I assume that they would be screaming that from the rooftops if they were more efficient. That said, I do think that competition in this space is good, and so I think that'll help drive drive improvements. And, and you know, we've been really tied to a small number of companies for for chips and chip design for a long time. So hopefully, it gets. Okay, I'm going to ask a dumb question. Is there any other companies out there besides Intel, AMD, and ARM? And ARM's really like a standard, I thought, more than anything. Like, is there any other, what's the word? Um, This is what I get for trying to do a podcast on a Wednesday at 9.30 when I'm not working all week and my brain's not functioning. Like frameworks. Um, Like type platforms. I mean, IBM have have their own platform. They had the power platform for a long time. Um, there's the the risk V architecture, although I don't know that they manage the mega own stuff. I think they they license technology just like I'm do to other people. Um, 
I thought risk view was mainly like satellites and stuff like that. No, no, I think it's it's coming. I think they're they're, they're trying to take on ARM, although they'll have a, a long way to go. Um, but but with lower licensing fees over the years, I suppose. I mean, I, I think ARM gets them like fifteen cents a, a core uh, in terms of licensing fees. Like when when Apple used an ARM core, they pay fifteen cents for it. So if if oh, wow. um, if risk view comes along and can do it for five cents a core, then uh, then great. Hmm. Today I learned. Yeah. Brought to you by Jonathan Bates. This is what you get for staying up all night <laughs> reading, yeah. reading nonsense on the internet. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, I think I drew the short straw in, in landing my name next to the, the uh, Defender for APIs <laughs> story. So I'll <laughs> give my best. Microsoft have announced the general availability of Microsoft Defender for APIs, which is designed to protect organizations against API security threats. You may think that's uh, covered by things like WAFs or, or other tooling, but Microsoft have a, a new tool for us. Defender for APIs offers lifecycle protection, detection, and response coverage for organizations and organizations managed APIs. Uh, it features um, CSPM, uh, API attack path analysis. Enrich, it enriches API data security uh, through MS information protection uh, purview integration, and it enables full lifecycle API protection from code to cloud. Yeah, sort of buried in that last one is probably the the best part of this announcement, which is the big difference about this and you know something like a laugh or something is that this is allowing sort of you to test your WAF controls and setup in your development pipeline, right? Which is not something that's been available today anywhere else. And so, like to Typically, you know, you have your WAF managed by either a centralized cloud or a security team, and you have your development staff. And when it's all working great and cohesive together, everything's hunky dory. But then you add a new uh, a new method, a new path that's not defined properly in the WAF, or conflicts with some sort of rule, and then all of a sudden you get a very, very difficult problem to troubleshoot. Um, and it's going to take you know coordination across multiple teams in order to do that. And so it's it's sort of a pain, right? And so I also like the fact that, you know, putting it in the development pipeline, it closes the feedback cycle. And so your API developers don't have to be like up on all the OWASP top 10 threats and all the things because, you know, and, and study, you know, the current emerging threats for, for new vectors. And, you know, there's a tool that they can lean on, they can rely on and sort of provide that feedback into the design of their API early enough to where that you can change it. It's not deploying it into production and seeing what's happening. So it, it this is a cool feature in the way that they rolled it out. Because the protections are, you know, something that you get in a lot of other ways. But definitely they are. And and I think to, to have a tool that can automatically um inspect the, the code that runs an API and decide whether or not data that it handles is sensitive or should meet some kind of um compliance criteria and then act on that, you know, with it with other tooling. Uh, whether it's whether it's uh you know, like backup and retention, or whether it's uh, enforcing encryption at rest, or things like that. And we're just just having like a holistic awareness of what the app's actually doing in the cloud is is awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Azure backup for AKS, the cloud native, enterprise ready Kubernetes aware backup. Microsoft shows that they still have no idea what containers are, what they're about, and they are announcing the general availability of Azure Backup for AKS. It's a simple cloud-native solution that enables you to protect your AKS clusters via backing up K workloads. So things that probably shouldn't have stateful data in them. Yep, let's back those up. Um, well, well, if you've patched your containers, you, you need to back them up. You don't have to patch yeah, them a second true. time. Once, once, yeah, you don't want to patch them again. Um. Yeah, you know, it's customers relying on stateful AKS clusters. They previously re relied on native Azure disk backups to protect their applications, um, which I suppose was convenient um, given the only technology choice at the time. But restoring the snapshots required a substantial effort to put back in service. And, and so uh, apparently the AKS stateful data backup service um, automates all of that. But uh, I would suggest that maybe, maybe don't do that. You're using the tool wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's it's reasonable that that, that some workloads need persistent volumes, uh, especially mm -hmm. with with uh, 
some people who like the idea of running SQL Server on containers mm-hmm. to get around licensing. Um, Justin, uh, to get around licensing uh, restrictions and or uh, you know cost reduction. But I don't know that I would brand this as backup for AKS necessarily. I mean, perhaps that data persisted in another system and, and you cover the backup using another tool. Uh, My guess is that it's, it's really the plugin at that sort of storage overlay layer of the, you know, the container orchestration. And so they, you know, it's just the coordination at that layer because you're declaring these volumes in, in your Kubernetes, like in your, your, as part of your pod service. And so you, in, instead of that being just a disk device on a Kubernetes cluster that the Kubernetes pods and services aren't aware of, now it's backing up by that volume, which is a Kubernetes construct that the, the overall platform understands. So the only nice thing about this is it does actually back up your Kubernetes state. So if you're not using a GitOps model, it does back up the actual state of your Kubernetes cluster, which is nice because if you are setting it up and you manually do stuff, because let's be honest, a lot of people get 80, 90% of the way in and they go in and they're like, hey, it just works now. We move on because that's never happened to, I'm sure, any of us. You know, it does back up the entire state of the cluster, plus backs up the persistent disk volumes, which is kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a dual release where it's two features that in tandem back up the whole cluster. But the state part is actually like, it's nice as a fail back, you know, hey, I thought I had it all in. Let me go look at what it was. Let me go launch, you know, redeploy to a, hey, a te- you know, a test cluster, see what the settings are in a DR event and then be able to, you know, tweak your actual flux, whatever, you know, your GitOps workflow mm-hmm. is to, to the, have those features in it. Mm, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that because, you know, typically when trying to recover that sort of thing, you just redeploy everything and, but I, this would allow a centralized, like sort of Kubernetes platform team, to just restore service functionality like themselves without having to make everyone sort of trigger their CI/CD pipelines or other deployment mechanisms. So, yeah, yeah. So all those changes that SRE make in the middle of the night when there's an outage won't get lost yeah. during the next outage. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So the last feature that Ada, that sorry, that Azure released this week, or I think actually a few weeks ago. But, um, that I actually wanted to talk about was the uh, private subnet for Azure, which is in public preview. So priorly, when you created a VNet and attached virtual machines to it, it would by default get public IP addresses. Uh, these IPs are... Mm, let's try that again. Uh, these IP addresses are not associated with means that troubleshooting uh, any sort of egress or anything else becomes difficult. Private subnets by default make it so that any new instance that's created inside your Vena does not by default get a public IP address, um, which means you can more easily tell it to route through uh, Azure Firewall via a NAT gateway or anything else along those lines. Today I learned that Azure didn't do this by default. <laughs> uh, so I'm not an Azure user. And so like I'm so spoiled because I wasn't around in the EC2 classic days where everything was sort of on the public internet. And I'm like, what? Why would you have public IPs on everything? That's expensive. Um, and so that's it's hilarious. I'm like, oh. Yeah, in other cool. news, Azure are running out of public IP space and so they have yes. to <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I, I yeah. I would bet you fifty dollars the first inception of this, they just hid the public IP from the <laughs> from the console and it's still there. It kind of sounds like they were using it as the as a unique identifier, honestly. The, the insistence of having a public IP, even things that didn't even have roots to to the ex to, you know, to the outside world, kind of makes me think that that was like inherited from perhaps the old ways of doing things. Oh, I bet it's tied to the magic network routing on the back end. Like the the underlying bit where it's just like you, how do you, yeah, it is a unique identifier because you're, you don't have to dedupe the, all that RFC 1918 space and still understand how to get the packets in the right place. Yeah. That's what Amazon built their entire network stack that the VPC runs on. I, I'm guessing that Microsoft didn't go and do that. Which is just sort of surprising, but I, I guess Azure was, you know, closer to Amazon's launch and maybe they got this out. Well, it was just fascinating that it is 2023, almost 2024, and this was not an option out there prior mm-hmm. to this. And it's actually not even G8 yet. 
And this was like a release during Microsoft Ignite. And I was just like, wait, what? This this is not the way this works. Like my brain just didn't process that that subnets that had nine gateways still, you know, the instances still had, sorry, the virtual machines still had, you know, public IP addresses somewhere. And, you know, security is such a thing in this world. And they're like, oh yeah, but everything has a public IP. Wait, what? Let's try this again. That's not secure. You're you're ditching a couple layers of your defense and depth mitigation by, by having those publicly addressable. I mean, it's not, the last resort, Not the end of right? The world. You have to have a lot of things, but it does make things more complicated. It makes your, you know, like you can't use like the large nuclear hammers for for routing and keeping internal traffic internal and traffic meant for, you know, egress to the internet, going on separate paths and having different rules for inspection. So this is this will be. I'm sure this is going to be really helpful to a ton of people who have their workloads on Azure. Hopefully, this doesn't require them to redeploy everything to take advantage of it. As soon as this becomes GA, I'm planning to implement this <laughs> at my day job. So I will okay. let you know when Matt does a thing slash gets mad at <laughs> Azure, part 87 <laughs> of the day. Um, and let you know how that goes because we found a fun, a couple fun gotchas this week uh, with some of the supported features in Azure. I'm going to cut them some slack a little bit, I think. This is this is really no different than, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say Launch Wizard 1. And everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about in AWS, where you, where you <laughs> launch an instance in the console, and it, and it gives you the most insecure configuration you could possibly have in a public subnet with a public IP, open with HTTP and SSH and, and everything mm-hmm. else. It, it, this is this is Launch Wizard 1, uh, you know, as your style, really. This, it was a great enabler early on for people to go in there, connect to machines to the internet, remote desktop to it, start working and do stuff. I think you could always have turned off that routing. You could always have, have not allowed it public egress or, or ingress. So it's just, it's a pivot from a, a, a insecure default. So it's yeah. it's good to see. Why, why it's having to go through a, a preview period kind of boggles me slightly. But, um, you know, I, I, I guess... To, to answer Matt's question of, well, I hope this is a seamless change, I'm going to say it's not a seamless change, which is why they've announced the deprecation date um, for the existing way of working in September 2025. So I think I think you're going to end up having to redeploy stuff. Yeah, th- this definitely smells of this is a very large backend change on the Azure side, right? Like this is implementing a new way of doing that magic networking layer that they sort of handle as part of the service. All right, that is all for the News in Cloud this week. I'll see you later, guys. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Did you guys hear about the uh, open AI kerfluffle that happened and happened and then continued to happen? It's I did. You know, I was like I was on the kind of on the edge of my seat for it a little bit. And like <laughs> felt like the it felt like it was like a Marvel movie or something and the universe <laughs> was hanging in the balance for a little while there. Yeah. Like did they discover something <laughs> amazing? It was this was this uh, conflict over something you know groundbreaking and outstanding and potentially like life changing for people or was it something else and the absolute lack of of information coming out of of OpenAI for what's been weeks now is just um, just mind blowing. Yeah, I also feel like it was you know back and forth. Hey, he's there. Hey, he's not there. I guess somebody should quickly summarize yeah, um, everything yeah, so, just to catch people up. <laughs> so we have it sort of written down here, which is, you know, titled uh, WTF just happened at OpenAI. So like on the Friday after recording our last episode, um, the news came out that the OpenAI board had fired some Ultman and appointed CTO Meyer Moretti as the interim CEO. Greg Brockman also was stepping down from the board, but was going to stay in his role. The board cited transparency issues for the reason of Sam Altman's departure. Greg later resigned as well, as did hundreds of employees, or at least threatened to leave, starting a very crazy weekend of rumors and, and uproar and speculation. 
and uh it was yeah no information right at the beginning and and so it kind of went nuts um there was a apparently a huge movement inside where a ton of employees were threatening to resign unless he was reinstated and over the weekend the talks had fallen apart and so satya Nutella. CEO of Microsoft announced that Greg and Sam Altman would join Microsoft, leading a very new AI R&D team, which in theory would directly compete with this giant Microsoft investment that they just made. Um, so that, you know, definitely changes things from, from the original, like, oh, this is a CEO board fight. And um, so that's pretty crazy. Uh, OpenAI made one announcement, and they announced Emmett Shear would be the new CEO of OpenAI. Shear was the former CEO of Twitch, and he had resigned from Twitch in March of 2023. And then, Wednesday before Thanksgiving, when we're still in our hang- reInvent hangover, uh, OpenAI announced that Sam Altman would be returning to OpenAI as CEO. And as of November 29th, it was official as OpenAI made a statement that Sam Altman was back as CEO, Maria, Mira, sorry, Mariah T would return as CTO and Greg Brockman returns as president. Um, as the chain, as with the change, there were several board members that were ousted and Microsoft is taking a new advisory role on the board, presumably to prevent this from ever happening again. It's a non, non-voting board seat to observe. I mean, I guess I just want a heads up this time instead of a 60-second notice uh, by text message that the $10 billion investment may be flushing down mm-hmm. the pan. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if they're trying to get a, you know, they're worried about anti-compete or if they're trying, there's some sort of distance that Microsoft is keeping this and I don't under, I don't quite understand it either. No, the, the fact that this got wrapped up over a weekend and announced on, on Monday by Microsoft that, that uh, Greg and Sam are going to join Microsoft, um, I, I think it's going to have consequences. I would not be surprised if, if there's going to be, uh, you know, an SEC investigation. People probably made trades on Monday morning based on the um, based on the idea that there are these mines and potentially 500 staff from OpenAI when they go to bail and, and have been offered positions at Microsoft. Um, that's huge. It's huge news. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back at the at the the stock price for Microsoft, it looks like they had a bit of a dip and a bump and it went, kind of went back to normal and nothing really changed uh, after about 48 hours. So I, I don't see any kind of like fines or legal action being taken by investors, really. Uh, but what a what a roller coaster. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, the wild ride of, you know, this going from was this you know a C, you know we're in, the, in this modern era where we have a lot of information and there's a lot of news reports of ceos and bad behavior causing termination and this is more just um you know given what what has been released so far which is practically nothing it's literally just uh a, a difference in opinion and what needs to be reported to the board um and I, I thought that was pretty crazy, and it was tied to you know differences in in the purpose of OpenAI as a company, whether it's revenue generating and should focus on on productization of of those models, or should it be more of a research firm um, that's you know a think tank that's specializing. And so that I think is pretty crazy to have such a public feud like that, and then have it reversed. As I, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I've never heard of someone being unfired. No, and, and just just the, the the fact that so many OpenAI employees signed the the open letters to the board yeah. threatening mm-hmm. to, to to walk. It was like eighty yeah. percent or something. Unbelievable. It was like a really high mm-hmm. number. It was like eighties, nineties. I feel like I like I remember seeing the numbers. Yeah. It was insane. Yeah, and the fact that Microsoft found out the same time that the rest of us found out when they've when they've invested as much money, like it really speaks to. A very knee-jerk reaction by the board. So, I think the fact that a lot of them are no longer on the board is probably a good thing. <laughs> I mean, I get Microsoft's response, which is you know they invested a lot into it, they leveraged the technology a lot in their major cloud. You know, unlike AWS and GCP, which has built their own, so like they're very heavily tied to them as a partner. You know, which is also a lot of their models, right? Like you can't send emails directly from Microsoft, which confuses me because you know they run O365. Um, but 
you know, you have to use SendGrid. Where so like they they're very much like we'll do our thing, we'll grab partners like here, OpenAI to handle all of our AI services. Where AWS and Google kind of bring it more natively in and develop in house. But it's where they really needed to either say we have to own this and hire everyone to get the brain power and the mind share of everyone, so they didn't lose a full segment of their product. And compared to that, their conference the week before. They must have said Copilot and Gen AI <laughs> more times than I could physically handle. Like literally pause one of the keynotes at one point because they couldn't handle so I'm saying Copilot mm-hmm. anymore. So like <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder if Satya ever really thought and I, I, I give credit to the man for uh, putting that deal together and, and, and pulling it all you know, all together the way it was by Monday morning. That must have been a very long weekend for a lot of people. I wonder if it was <laughs> yeah. ever really, um, if he ever really believed that that was the way it was going to go, or whether it was just a you know a chip in a poker game to to force the, the OpenAI board to do the other thing and bring oh, everybody I think back. They had cheaper chips to play, given how much money they've played. Like I don't know, and like I think that that was definitely scramble mode. By all parties. Yeah, it's it was definitely scramble mode, but what's okay, two hundred and forty thousand, so what's in below a hundred million dollars a year for Microsoft versus losing all of OpenAI and all the Gen AI that they have in their main in Azure. Like it's it's a massive segment that they are heavily leading on right now. And the whole industry is I mean, we have a whole segment now in the podcast just for AI news. So like it's such a big piece of the of the market right now that if they all of a sudden lost OpenAI, it would kill all confidence in all their clients. So they had to say, like, while it is a chip, I think that they bet they would have had to bite the bullet. Otherwise, so many customers would have been like, "You're leveraging a third party for this core aspect of your product," and now they went, now they're in this turmoil. Like, what do you want us to do? How do you we trust you as a client? of your platform and of these services. Like that's a very fair point. I hadn't really thought about it that way. That's awesome. Helps when your day job has to yeah. think about these things. <laughs> I, I know. I I've enjoyed playing around with Chat GPT and GPT four and um some of the open source models and things lately. And I to begin with when people started complaining about how they were getting dumber and dumber, I, I was like, no, no, they're not. You know, it's just it's just bad news. I know I, I totally agree that I, I think the fear of legal action right now has made them really tone down what these models are capable of actually providing. To the point where I, I, I asked um uh, you know, a question the other day it was actually around the AWS reinvent badges. You know, so it, you know, people show up they have ID cards. They 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 book sessions. They sh- they badge into sessions. So Amazon knows exactly which people are in which sessions because you badged in. Amazon has also given people these anonymous uh, radio tags to help with crowd control, um, you know, transportation, uh, things like that, security and safety, and things like that. And I was I was kind of going through this mental thing in my head, like, how much data would you need to collect about people to actually be able to tie those anonymous signals? back to the actual signals from the badges. Now, assuming they have these receivers for these badges in various locations, let's say they had a receiver in every conference room. During a conference, they know who's badged in, they know who's booked the session, they know who's there. Mm-hmm. And and now they know that 500 of these six or 7,000, however many thousand badges belong to those people. So now you've, you've narrowed that, that pool down, the potential pool. You know, one of those badges is one of those, one of those 500 people. How many sessions would they need to attend to actually narrow those anonymous um, tags down to the actual owners of the um, of the badge? And mm-hmm. at that point, you know, if if they use Amazon Sidewalk technology, which I assume they do, they I don't think they built a whole new technology just to just to you know deliver this service at reInvent. You know, are people taking these badges home? To, can they now potentially? I'm not saying they're doing this. It's just it's just a mind. Yeah, yeah, I'm just no. a mind game, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's easy no, but I mean, this is this is how you stay aware, right? You look at this and you're like, that's two data sets. 
That's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So, so I, I had in my mind, like I was thinking, like, I could not model this out in Python. I could, I could say, well, this many sessions and there's this many types of sessions and people, people may want to attend. Like they may be there just for InfoSec. Mm -hmm. They may be there for a couple of different things. And so it was kind of like modeling a population and modeling the sessions. And then I was going to run some simulations around, um, around the whole thing. Like how many sessions would a person, an average person have to attend given those parameters to actually narrow down the anonymous badge to their actual identity so that if they went home or if they were on Vegas Strip someplace, you know, Hooker Lounge or someplace else, Amazon could know who they were and where they were. Did you say Hooker uh, or that's Hooker Lounge? That's left to the radio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is Vegas. <laughs> it, is, it is Vegas. Um, I, it, does that answer is it's, it's not, not a lot. It's not a lot. Like, I mean, it's just difficult enough. That there's no way I would do it because I'm not – made of time but 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 it, but for honestly it, if you had any set of time it was like there was an article that was like you know somebody bought from you know one of the data services hey i want po politicians that live in the dc area that have these six things yep. and give me all mm -hmm. their search history and it was like asking these six things gave you so much yeah. more information than like people realize gave you so like just gathering yep, that was absurd and like it's there's so much data out there that making these tiny links between stuff isn't difficult it's like the game of guess excel who. and a v lookup can do it's it it's like the guess who game the kids play you know you, you get to flip up the, the things then you get to ask you know does does the person have blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes do they have glasses do they have curly hair do they have a beard and within 10 questions you can narrow down your opponent's uh, you know, choice of, of character in the game to the actual person. You know, the whole point of the game is to narrow down the search by asking questions to... to, to Would you call it a search yeah. algorithm? <laughs> so the, the, getting back to the point, I, I'd written up like my, my question around the mathematics involved and how to model something like that in Python to chat GPT, expecting some kind of sensible answers back because a few months ago, I'd asked some pretty complex questions and got really comprehensive answers back. And it refused to help me. It flat out huh. refused to help me because of because of concerns over privacy and anonymity. Anonym, uh, anonymity. I'm like, no persuading. I'm like, this is this is a you know this this is the situation. These people mm -hmm. attended the conference. They had anonymous. Like, no persuading the model would let it help me with the problem because it seemed like I was trying to compromise somebody's personal. Um, safety or security or anonymity and it really really pissed me off <laughs> yeah so did you write this algorithm that's the real question or you cannot say i have not written, I have not written it yet i plan on writing it just for fun <laughs> it's also advent of code this month which i thought about doing i was actually going to do it with um a language i hadn't used before just to kind of force me into into trying to figure something out i was going to go with rust but i haven't started it yet so on a future show, when Jonathan says a thing, you'll have to tell us about it. Yeah, and then he'll have he'll have awkward questions like, "Why were you uh, at this hookah bar <laughs> um, off the strip?" That sounds good. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll catch you all next week. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye everyone.